resurrection for worship this evening. I invite you to rise as we begin. We begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of His Spirit to amend our lives continues with us because of his love for us in Jesus our Savior. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as if from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe that thereby our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name of and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other, as Jesus became our servant. It is, however, in the Holy Communion that the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of himself and participate in that new covenant which makes us one in him. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. In our sin and sinfulness we make excuses, squandering and taking for granted the grace of God and the banquet he so freely gives. Most merciful God, we confess that our very nature is sinful. We do not love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We do not love our neighbors as ourselves. It is natural for us to make excuses when you are present gifts to us. Because of our sinfulness, we deserve to be shut out of the banquet. Though you are great generous in your love, we deserve only your wrath. Forgive us, most holy God. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We read responsibly hymn Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our readings. Tonight's Old Testament reading is from Exodus, where the Lord initiates and institutes the Passover. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for the household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever, and you shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, where Paul recapitulates the institution of the Lord's Supper. For, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we might not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening, everyone. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. 
Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he'd washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace and mercy be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are two appointed epistle readings for the church for tonight. One is the passage from 1 Corinthians, which we all just heard. An alternate, which I'd also like us to consider with our focus on the topic of the Lord's Supper this evening, is from the book of Hebrews. And let me just read that to you. It's from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. And by God's will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every Jewish temple priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here we are. It's Maundy Thursday. First of three very special services that put a kind of a point of climax to this Passion Week, this Holy Week. Maundy Thursday, of course, as we just spoke a moment ago, is our celebration of all that took place on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Before Jesus' arrest, before his betrayal, before even any of his time in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus met with his disciples in Jerusalem to celebrate and eat the Passover. They gathered in an upper room of a building somewhere in Jerusalem, and it's here that Jesus instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper. Jesus started that special meal in connection with the Jewish feast of Passover and unleavened bread. It's a ritual meal closely tied to the history of God's people, who by God's mighty hand and in connection with the Passover event were released from their bondage of slavery in Egypt and set their course as sojourners for the promised land. Five of our congregation's youth, Ethan, Wyatt, Charlotte, Zachary, and Eloise, who will be receiving Holy Communion for the first time tonight. Some of them are out of town for the vacation, but some of them are also here. Um, They've taken time not only to learn about what Holy Communion is all about, they've studied what the Lord's Supper means and the gifts that it conveys and brings to them. And then one week ago, they took time to see the connection between the Passover and the Lord's Supper, where we gathered in the Fellowship Hall to have a Christian Seder meal. And in that, not eating the Passover lamb, but remembering Jesus is our Passover lamb. And this meal that was celebrated by Jesus and his disciples was to prepare them and connect them to the work of God in freeing them from their sins and all that Jesus Christ would do for them. So now we, together with all of these first communion goers, gather not only to remember and celebrate just how life-giving the Lord's Supper is, we gather to touch, taste, and receive the very body and blood of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins once again. As people who receive Jesus together, 
we have the God-given confidence to know that there's no longer anything, there's no longer anyone who can keep us somehow apart from God. There is nothing and no one that can separate us from the love of God, which is ours in Christ. And when I talk about all of that tonight, I want to focus on that word confidence. Talking about God-given confidence, I'm not talking about it in the context of a kind of self-confidence or bluster the way we may be used to hearing or using that word. I use it in the sense of boldness, in the sense of an at-ease sort of attitude before God because of the forgiveness of sins that Jesus Christ has won for us. It's a little like the attitude of belonging that uh, if you're a pastor's kid or if, uh, uh, you know, if you've known of one yourself, you might remember what it was like to show up at church and just sort of feel like this was your turf, you know. You could sit in, you sit in your dad's chair and, you know, you were kind of in charge. You belonged. You didn't have to ask anybody for permission to go into the pastor's office and sit in his chair. Didn't ask, have to ask for any kind of or make an apology for sort of, you know, going where you wanted to go, this was the spot that you had kind of a right to be at as the pastor's kid. Well, because of Christ and because of what Christ has done for us in his death and resurrection, we can think of our own heavenly Father and enjoy the confidence of that one-on-one -on -one presence with him, knowing that there's no need to ask for permission there's no need to uh, make some kind of, of uh, you know, do some kind of special work or special job that Jesus Christ has done it all for us. Now, one of the biggest challenges to this kind of confidence, this God-given confidence in life, is when we get to a place in life where either because of a momentary moral lapse or a longer-lasting trial, time of, of true spiritual challenge, or even maybe a slow burn of a fading faith that occurs over time, no matter what it looks like, we feel like we're in a place where there's something we got to do to get that fire of faith lit in us once again. So times like this it helps to remember where the gift of God, God's confidence, that God-given confidence, where that truly comes from. And you can see the answer in just the phraseology I'm using. So the word confidence comes from the Hebrews reading appointed for tonight. Let's start there and then see where this takes us as we try to get a handle on where confidence and boldness before God comes from. The book of Hebrews tells us that we have God-given confidence that the only sacrifice, the only offering to God for sins that ever needed to be made has been made once and for all by the Son of God, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Many years ago, I used a workbook for adult faith formation that had these wonderful true and false questions in it to sort of review what people were getting and learning. And a lot of the true and false questions were kind of obvious and had sort of immediate answers. Uh, true or false, good Christians have no anxieties. False. Uh, true or false, Christ participated in the work of creation. True. Okay. But most were kind of tricky. And so you'd answer the question, but you'd have to kind of explain your answer or say how you were hearing the question. And there was one question that always got conversations going that I'll never forget, and it goes like this. In view of Jesus' once and for all sacrifice for sins by his death on the cross, offering and sacrifices are no longer necessary. True or false? Because of Jesus' sacrifice for sins on the cross, sacrifice is no longer necessary. Who would say true to that? Okay. Who would say false to that? Who's too worried to answer to raise their hand? <laughs> Well, actually, it kind of depends on how you, as I said, how you read the question, right? Um, you could say, for example, that offerings and sacrifices are a very normal, expected response to what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, right? 
But the word of God in the book of Hebrews assures us that the only sacrifice, the only offering to God for sins that ever needed to be made has already been made once and for all by God's son, Jesus Christ on the cross. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If somebody asks you when you were saved, you say, when Jesus died for me. That's when it happened. Simple. Jesus Christ died as our Passover lamb. And that sacrificial death has brought us life. That gift of salvation means that we have received the invitation to come to the table of the Lord this evening. It's not a matter of our sacrificing or our committing or our perfect and unswerving faith. No, our inclusion in the supper tonight requires of us only empty hands to receive God's gifts. When Jesus died on the cross and the temple curtain was torn from, in two from top to bottom, all that that indicated was that there was no longer anything, no sin, no impurity, no lack of faith that could come between the God of the universe and the forgiven sinners that were standing before him. So when we come together tonight to receive Jesus' body and blood in and with bread and wine and Holy Communion, we aren't, first of all, somehow reenacting what Jesus did to sort of sacrifice Jesus all over again. And we're certainly not bringing some necessary third element into the process to sort of jumpstart bread and wine and turn it into the body and blood of Jesus by our faith by some certain level of fervent faith. No, Jesus has done everything already needed. He's done what's required for us to receive his body and blood in empty hands. The work is finished. It's taken care of. It is over and done, period. So the first takeaway received from Hebrews that the only sacrifice needed has been made once and for all by Jesus. That's where our confidence from God comes from. If Jesus is our Passover lamb and has made the perfect sacrifice for our sins, all there's left for us to do is to receive him. And St. Paul bears that point out as he tells the Corinthian Christians that the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper is not ordinary bread and wine by itself, no matter how we as people of faith approach it. First, Paul tells us, he lets us know that what we eat and drink is not ordinary bread and wine, but ordinary bread and wine made extraordinary by the word of Jesus. Jesus said about the bread and about the cup drunk by the Corinthian Christians and by us tonight, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is my body. Those are Jesus' words. That should end any speculation right off the bat about, you know, whether this is some kind of symbolic thing that is happening. It is what Jesus says it is, his body and his blood. But then, as Paul calls out the unacceptable behavior of the Corinthians, who, as they're celebrating the supper, made it part of a larger communal meal where folks brought their own food, kind of like a big potluck, and those that were rich would feast on their rich food and those who didn't have so much didn't have enough to eat. Paul makes it clear that the body and blood of Jesus, which had become a part of this meal, was something that they were guilty of sinning against. And in doing so, he makes it clear that the bread and wine of the sacrament cannot simply be symbols and nothing more. Eating and drinking in the unworthy way they were, Paul warned, would make them guilty concerning the body and blood of Jesus. If what we receive in the Lord's Supper were only bread and wine that somehow symbolized our Lord's body and blood, how could such guilt even be possible? I mention all of this not because I'm worried that we're going to turn Lord's Supper tonight into some kind of a, you know, a huge banquet or you know, overdo it or something like that. Rather, because... This bread and wine made extraordinary, made 
the very body and blood, made something that conveys to us, brings to us the very body and blood of Jesus Christ because of his word, does so just like that. It's ordinary bread and wine, which by the word of God we receive with the very body and blood of Jesus. We don't understand how it works. We might even be tempted to doubt that Jesus' word accomplishes what it says it accomplishes. But God's presence in the supper, here's the main point, God's presence in the supper is not a matter of how strong or weak our faith is. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, the strengthening of our faith, all of that comes to us freely and completely in the supper, no matter where our faith is on the scale of weak to strong, on the scale of one to ten. The perfect sacrifice of Jesus makes all of that confidence in that gift received possible. The body and blood of Jesus, which we receive in and with bread and wine in the Lord's Supper, delivers Jesus. It delivers the confidence that we need. It's not up to you and me to somehow make it effective. We take heart that it delivers what God says that it does. There's no reason why we shouldn't take every opportunity to receive these gifts in Holy Communion together and to do so regularly. And that brings me back to Hebrews again as we consider the outcome of the confidence that's ours in Christ. As people who share the gift of this confidence of God's presence together, we meet together, stirring one another up to love and good works. At this last month's men's breakfast, it was interesting that one of you asked the question if there was anything in the Bible that spoke to the whole question of whether it was important to actually meet together in person or attend worship together, you know, to actually gather together in person. It's not to say that sometimes we have to gather separately because we're shut in or because there's reasons for health reasons why we can't come together. But is there anywhere in the Bible where it speaks to that? And the, and the answer then and now was yes. Regarding where the Bible talks about it, the value of meeting in person, you just heard it. Let me read Hebrews 10, 24, 25 again. We consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Lord's Supper is at the center of that meeting together. And we stand together shoulder to shoulder at the communion rail here, or whether it's person by person, shoulder to shoulder, in front at the Family Life Center, wherever it is, we put our empty hands to receive the tangible gifts of God. We are living out the fact of our own human emptiness when left to our own power and strength. God's desire is not that we suffer that emptiness on our own. His call for us is to meet together, to be nourished by his word and sacraments, and to, re to receive renewed hearts that empower us to encourage one another to greater service, to love, and acts of good. There's a Japanese proverb that you may have heard me share before. I like to often bring it in when we're talking about the presence of God. Um, it's kind of a, a downer, but I hope you hear me through this whole thing. Sawara nu kami ni tatarinashi. Sawara nu kami ni tatarinashi. Translate a word for word. It comes out as, a God that you keep at arm's length can't hurt you. A God you keep at arm's length can't hurt you. More loosely or colloquially translated, it appears in dictionaries as something like, let sleeping dogs lie or leave well enough alone, something like that. Now, it's obvious that whoever came up with that proverb to say, you know, leave well enough alone, had a vision or understanding of little g gods as powers or forces at work in the world that made payback, punished bad behavior for, for, with more bad stuff. The writer of the book of Hebrews wants us to hear loud and clear that our dealings with God have to do with the forgiveness of our sins. There's no reason, there's no need, there's every reason to do just the opposite than to keep God at arm's length. In fact, 
if we could flip this proverb around and say what, we really, what it really needs to say, we might say just the opposite and say something like, our God who by way of Jesus, our Passover lamb is with us and in us can only give us blessing and confidence for life. Tonight, we give thanks for that gift of confidence. Eager to live with that confidence, we gather again at the Lord's table tonight. Made confident by the God who is with us and in us tonight, we resolve to gather again and again to grow by his strength in us. And as we do, the peace which passes all human understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to rise now. As we together, with that confidence that God has given us, make confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now welcome one another with that peace of God that he has first reached out to us with. The peace of the Lord be with you. Greet those around you with that same peace. pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing us close to you, for giving us the confidence 
earned for us by the sacrificial death of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may approach you, that we now are at peace with you, and that you desire for us to have that one-on-one participation, that one-on-one time with you. May you continue to guide us in this relationship, that we may continually meet together in person to receive your good and perfect gifts reminding us that there is no longer any separation between us and you, but that your love that is ours in Christ will always draw us near to your presence. Lord, in your mercy. And Heavenly Father, as we joyfully come together to receive your good and perfect gifts at your table and before your altar, we celebrate today with those who will commune with us for the first time. We celebrate with Zachary, Charlotte, Wyatt, and Eloise, and their families. May you continue to strengthen them in their faith. Shower upon them your forgiveness and grace this day and to life eternal. May you continually build them up in their faith. Guide them in their faith journey as they are always drawn closer to you. Surround them with the arms of your church, with their families, and all those that you will use to continue to guide them in their faith walk. Lord, in your mercy. And Savior, Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the example and the service that you give us. We thank you for your story of washing your disciples' feet, that in this you show us what true love looks like. May we follow your lead, your example, to love and serve as you love and serve us always putting the needs of others before ourselves and to looking and to look for ways that we may continually serve in your mission. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be...
No matter who we are and no matter how we gather tonight, we leave as people who have received again Jesus Christ himself. With the confidence that comes from that sacrifice for our sins, we leave with his benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. be seated for the stripping of the altar. From Psalm chapter 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple.
I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet, <clears throat> yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me 
with all your ways. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness, or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you, in the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They, de they surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. <laughs> 